Remember that our aim is to have as many processes as possible in memory, uh, since we want to increase the degree of multi-programming. If you have multiple processes available in the memory at any point in time, the scheduler will always find a process to execute next. Schedule that one. So some of these processes, remember, uh, will be in ready state and some will be in uh, waiting states, waiting for some, for example, some IO or for synchronization, as we discussed in the previous chapter. If you have few processes in memory, uh, then it is likely that at some point during the execution, uh, those uh, all of those processes are in waiting state and the scheduler cannot find a process in the ready state to schedule, which means the CPU cycles go idle. So if you have multiple process, many processes available uh, in memory, then it's more likely that the scheduler will always find a process uh, available for execution and continue with that, although some of the processes are uh, just in the ready state. However, uh, since we have limited memory, the uh, you will not be able to fit so many processes into the memory. So one solution is to swap some processes out so that you can bring others into the memory. Uh, so uh, this way, you can change the set of available processes uh, in the memory. The swap space is a backing store. That means actually a disk partition, uh, also called swap partition. For example, when you're uh, installing a Linux system, you might have seen that. So the swap is some storage space on the disk into which you can uh, transfer the memory image of a process. See, the process is, not, I'm not talking about the program, I'm talking about the process. During the execution of the process, remember the variables have some values and those values are changing as the statements are getting executed. So at some point in time, you take the snapshot of that process onto the disk. That means you copy the binary image of that process in the uh, memory onto the disk, into the swap partition, into the backing store. Uh, and then when you do that, the memory space for that process has become available. That means you can bring in the previously stored uh, memory image of some other process into that place that has now become available. So that backing store or the swap storage or the swap partition, however you call it, is a fast disk, which is typically large enough to accommodate the uh, copies of all memory images for all processes that could be running uh, in the system at any point in time. And what we're doing is we're eating, either swapping out or swapping in a process. So taking a process out of memory and writing it onto the uh, swap storage is called swap out or also called roll out and the other one is called swap in. So this uh, swapping itself takes some time. Uh, so you should look at the context switch time. The, uh, that's the cost of doing context switch and uh, decide accordingly. For example, if you have 100 megabytes, uh, a process of uh, 100 megabytes being swapped out onto the uh, swap storage with the hard disk, with a hard disk that has a transfer rate of 50 megabytes per second, then it will take you two seconds to swap out this process. To take it. So this swap out process itself would take around two seconds. Now, of course, it depends on the disk speed. It depends on the size of the process. But see, these are this 50 megabytes per second is a typical transfer rate, and 100 megabytes 
is a typical process size. Of course, you can have faster disk or slower disk, and of course, larger or smaller processes. But the important thing is you should keep in mind that swap in out operations are at the uh, rate of seconds. Then, if you're swapping out something, you should also be swapping in something. Let's assume it's a process of the same size because we're trying to uh, swap in a process into the same space. So approximately, let's say, the same size. So that's yet another two seconds. So that swap in out operations in total will take four seconds. That means the scheduler cannot say, OK, I'm going to uh, schedule next a process that's in swap space because it will take at least uh, around four seconds for that process to be loaded into the memory. So there should be something else, some other process that's responsible for managing these swap operations and also uh, following the length of the ready queue to see if the ready queue is getting almost empty. So it should be a proactive action to decide on swap operations so that before the ready queue becomes empty, you swap in some processes. Uh, you can reduce uh, this time if reduced size of the uh, memory is uh, swapped uh, by knowing how much memory uh, is really being used. And system calls uh, can be used to inform the operating system by making use of the request memory and release memory uh, functions. Uh, other constraints, uh, constraints are also uh, there. So uh, for pending IO operations, for example, if a process is waiting for some IO to occur and you're trying to transfer the uh, data from the disk directly into the process's address space, you shouldn't swap out that process because if you swap that one out and bring another uh, process in its place, the IO controller would write the data into that place where things it should have written, but now there's another process there. So you shouldn't be swapping out such a process. Well, typically we want to swap out such processes because they're the ones that are not ready for execution. So, and a solution to that uh, will be, uh, you don't directly write into the uh, processes address space, but the IO device transfers the data into the kernel address space. And then it's the kernel that copies from the kernel buffers into the process address space. This is called double buffering, and definitely it adds some overhead. But for example, it uh, bypasses the problem we already mentioned. Uh, standard swapping is not used, as we discussed, in modern operating systems. But modified versions of this are uh, being used. So, uh, for example, you swap only when free memory is extremely low. You know, otherwise, you try to avoid swapping, for example. Uh, to increase the degree of multi-programming, what you can uh, do is, uh, you, in the memory, you can have multiple partitions, where into each partition, you put a process. As process is complete, their memory look, uh, area, their address space, will be reclaimed by the operating system by opening what we call a hole, like the blue area here, in the memory. Like process 8 has terminated, so its space has become available. Now, a new process, let's say process 9 is being created, you find some available hole. In this example, we have only one hole, so, sorry, this case will be given to process nine, and the rest will be now available. So that means the whole is now diminished. Then another process, process 10 is created. So again, you give some space to process 10, 
uh, and this is the remaining freehold. Now, of course, there is now a problem uh, if a new process that's to be created, let's say 11, uh, cannot fit in here, then that means although you have some available space, since process 11 cannot fit in here, you will say, you're running out of memory, we cannot take that. Don't worry, we'll find a solution for this later on. Now, the first question that would come to mind is, if I had multiple of these holes, let's say for process nine, which one would I be, uh, which hole should I be selecting? Because typically as processes come and go, there will be several openings. For example, let's assume that process five completes. If process five completes, you would have another opening here, another hole here. So there's one hole here and another one here. And process 11 is, uh, let's say, being created, which can fit into one of these two. So it can fit in any one of those two. But which one to choose? One solution will be the first fit, which means just uh, try to find a hole. The first one you find uh, in which the uh, new process can fit, that's good enough. So it's a very simple uh, algorithm, as you can see. The other one is the best fit, which will allocate the smallest hole. For example, if process 11 requires, let's say, uh, 50 kilobytes of RAM, and you have holes of size 60 kilobytes, 80 kilobytes, 100 kilobytes, you pick the one uh, with 60 kilobytes, because that will be the best fit well, it's not 50, but at least it's 60. That will be the best fit because it's uh, remaining with the smallest uh, leftover hole, okay? And the worst fit would be, remember, we want 50. We have the options of 60, 80, and 100. In the case of worst fit, you pick the 100. Now, uh, it sounds like Best fit is the best because the name is best fit. And worst fit is expected to be the worst because it's called the worst fit. But note that if you apply best fit, it will be leaving over uh, some small hole, which will be typically very small. Like in the example we discussed, you will be left with 10 kilobytes of memory. Typically 10 kilobytes of memory would be too small for any process. So you would have a hole there, which is very small, but it's so small that it's not good for anyone. So it's just unused space. It's just wasted. Okay. And if you run best fit for some time, you will see that in the memory, you have tiny, tiny holes in many places. If you sum them up, the sum would be uh, enough for maybe for a couple of new processes, but unfortunately it is separated into small pieces, so it's unusable. In other words, if you look at the amount of available space, it looks like you have some reasonable amount of space, but still you get out of memory errors because no process can fit into any one of those tiny holes. So that's why actually worst fit might be better than best fit. So first fit and best fit uh, are better than worst fit uh, in terms of speed and uh, storage utilizations, but worst fit is good in the sense that uh, it leaves us uh, some opportunities also. Now, when we're working this way, we do have what's called the external fragmentation. So the total memory space exists to satisfy a request, as we discussed, but since it's not contiguous, it's in different places, if you need some large space, it will not fit into any one of these small holes. That's called external fragmentation because the memory is fragmented into many uh, pieces, many partitions, and this fragmentation is outside any partition. That's why it's called external fragmentation. 
if the allocated memory uh, may be slightly larger than the requested uh, memory, then that remaining memory inside that partition is called internal fragmentation. Again, it's not being used. If you analyze the first fit algorithm we discussed in the previous slide, it will reveal that given n blocks uh, allocated, that means if you take the snapshot of the memory at some point in time and you see that n blocks have been allocated, assuming, uh, let's say here, fixed size blocks, you have n blocks allocated, then you will have half of n, 0.5 times n blocks that are lost due to fragmentation. Because if there is no bias, uh, because of the 50% rule, if there is no bias, uh, half of it, uh, if you're given some block size, uh, what you need typically sometimes will be too small, so a lot of that block will be wasted. Sometimes it will be almost close to what you have in your hand, close to that block size, so very little will be wasted. But on the average, if there is no bias, half of those blocks would be wasted. Okay, so in total, out of 1.5 times n blocks, 0.5 of them will be wasted. In other words, one third may be unusable. You can solve external fragmentation problem by compaction, which means, remember, we had those tiny holes. We can shift all of the processes to one end, either to the high memory address or to low memory address, doesn't matter, to one end of the memory, which will bring all those tiny unused fragments together to form a large block, which could be used. But such memory compaction, typically, first of all, it's slow, and also it requires that the addresses are modified uh, all the addresses are modified, uh, which would work only if you have uh, execution time binding. Because, for example, if you had compile time binding or uh, load time binding, the addresses have been fixed. So if you shift them, you have to go over all addresses and fix them, which is extremely difficult. And also, you could easily make errors. So that would work, compaction would work only if you have execution time binding and also it's quite slow. 